cowardly lion and the hungry tiger. In the splendid palace of the Emerald City, which was in the centre of the fairy land of Oz, is the great throne room, where Princess Ozma, the ruler, for an hour each day, sits in a throne of glistening emeralds, and listens to all the troubles of her people, which they are sure to tell her about. Around Ozma's throne, on such occasions, are grouped all the important personages of Oz, such as the Scarecrow, Jack Pumpkinhead, Tick-Tock the Clockwork Man, the Tin Woodman, the Wizard of Oz, the Shaggy Man, and other famous fairy people. Little Dorothy usually has a seat at Ozma's feet and crouched on either side of the throne are two enormous beasts known as the Hungry Tiger and the Cowardly Lion. These two beasts are Ozma's chief guardians, but as everyone loves the beautiful girl princess, there has never been any disturbance in the great throne room, or anything for the guardians to do but look fierce and solemn, and keep quiet until the royal audience is over, and the people go away to their homes. Of course, no one would dare be naughty, while the huge lion and tiger crouched beside the throne. But the fact is, the people of Oz are very seldom naughty, so Ozma's big guardians are more ornamental than useful, and no one realises that better than the beasts themselves. One day, after everybody had left the throne room, except the cowardly lion and the hungry tiger, the lion yawned and said to his friend, I am getting tired of this job. No one is afraid of us and no one pays any attention to us. That is true, replied the big tiger, purring softly. We might as well be in the thick jungles where we were born, as trying to protect Ozma when she needs no protection and I'm dreadfully hungry all the time. You have enough to eat, I'm sure, said the lion, swaying his tail slowly back and forth. Enough, perhaps, but not the kind of food I long for, answered the tiger. What? I am hungry for his fat babies. I have a great desire to eat a few fat babies. Then perhaps the people of Oz would fear me, and I'd become more important. True, agreed the lion, it would stir up quite a rumpus if you ate but one fat baby. As for myself, my claws are sharp as needles, 
and strong as crowbars, while my teeth are powerful enough to tear a person to pieces in a few minutes. If I should spring upon a man and make chop suey of him, there would be wild excitement in the Emerald City, and the people would fall upon their knees and beg me for mercy. That, in my opinion, would render me of considerable importance. After you had torn the person to pieces, what would you do next? asked the tiger sleepily. Then I would roar so loudly it would shake the earth and stalk away to the jungle to hide myself before anyone could attack me or kill me for what? I had done. I see, nodded the tiger. You really are cowardly. To be sure, that is why I am named the Cowardly Lion. That is why I have always been so tame and peaceable. But I'm awfully tired of being tame added the lion with a sigh, and it would be fun to raise a row and show people what a terrible beast I really am. The tiger remained silent for several minutes, thinking deeply as he slowly washed his face with his left paw. I'm getting old, and it would please me to eat at least one fat baby before I die. Suppose we surprise these people of Oz and prove our power. What do you say? We will walk out of here just as usual, and the first baby we meet I'll eat in a jiffy, and the first man or woman you meet, you will tear to pieces. Then we will both run out of the city gates and gallop across the country, and hide in the jungle before anyone can stop us. All right. I'm game, said the lion, yawning slowly again, so that he showed his two rows of dreadfully sharp teeth. The tiger got up and stretched his great, sleek body. Come on, he said. The lion stood up and proved he was the larger of the two for he was almost as big as a small horse. Out of the palace they walked, and met no one. They passed through the beautiful grounds, past fountains and beds of lovely flowers, and met no one. Then they unlatched a gate, and then the street of the city, and met no one. I wonder how a fat baby will taste, remarked the lion, as they stalked majestically along, side by side. I imagine it will taste like nutmegs, said the lion. No, said the tiger, I've an idea it will taste like gumdrops. They entered a corner, but met no one, 
For the people of the Emerald City were accustomed to take their naps at this hour of the afternoon. I wonder how many pieces I ought to tear a person into, said the lion in a thoughtful voice. Sixty would be about right, suggested the tiger. Would that hurt any more than to tear one into a dozen pieces? inquired the lion with a little shudder. Who cares whether it hurts or not? growled the tiger. The lion did not reply. They entered a side street, but met no one. Suddenly they heard a child crying. Aha! exclaimed the tiger. There is my meat. He rushed round the corner, the lion following, and came upon a nice fat baby sitting in the middle of the street and crying as if in great distress. What's the matter? asked the tiger, crouching before the baby. I, I, I lost my ma, 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 mama, wailed the baby. Why, you poor little thing, said the great beast, softly stroking the child's head with its paw. Don't cry, my dear, for Mama can't be far away, and I'll help you find her. Go on, said the lion, who stood by. Go on where? asked the tiger, looking up. Go on and eat your fat baby. Why, you dreadful creature, said the tiger reproachfully. Would you want me to eat a poor little lost baby that doesn't know where its mother is? And the beast gathered the little one into its strong, hairy arms and tried to comfort it by rocking it gently back and forth. The lion growled low in his throat, and seemed very much disappointed, but at that moment a scream reached their ears, and a woman came bounding out of a house and into the street. Seeing her baby in the embrace of the monster tiger, the woman screamed again and rushed forward to rescue it. But in her haste she caught her foot in her skirt and tumbled head over heels and heels over head, stopping with such a bump that she saw many stars in the heavens, although it was broad daylight, and there she lay in a helpless manner, all tangled up and unable to stir. With one bound and a roar like thunder, the huge lion was beside her, with strong jaws, he grasped her dress and raised her into an upright position. Poor thing, are you hurt? he gently asked. Gasping for breath, the woman struggled to free herself and tried to walk, but she limped badly and tumbled down again. My baby, she said pleadingly. 
The baby is all right, don't worry, replied the lion. And then he added, keep quiet now, and I'll carry you back to your house, and the hungry tiger will carry your baby. The tiger, who had approached the place with the child in its arms, asked in astonishment, Aren't you going to tear her into sixty pieces? No, nor into six pieces, answered the lion indignantly. I am not such a brute as to destroy a poor woman who has hurt herself trying to save her lost baby. If you are so ferocious and cruel and bloodthirsty, you may leave me and go away, for I do not care to associate with you. That's all right answered the tiger. I'm not cruel, not in the least. I'm only hungry, but I thought you were cruel. Thank heaven I'm respectable, said the lion with dignity. He then raised the woman, and with much gentleness, carried her into her house where he laid her upon a sofa. The tiger followed with the baby, which he safely deposited besides its mother. The little one liked the hungry tiger, and grasping the enormous beast by both ears, the baby kissed the beast's nose to show he was grateful and happy. Thank you very much, said the woman. I've often heard what good beasts you are, in spite of your power to do mischief to mankind. And now I know that the stories are true. I do not think either of you have ever had an evil thought. The hungry tiger and the cowardly lion hung their heads and did not look into each other's eyes, for both were shamed and humbled. They crept away and stalked back through the streets until they again entered the palace grounds, where they retreated the pretty, comfortable rooms they occupied at the back of the palace. There they silently crouched in their usual corners to think over their adventure. After a while, the tiger said sheepishly, I don't believe fat babies taste like gumdrops. I'm quite sure they have the flavour of raspberry tarts. My, how hungry I am for fat babies. The lion grunted disdainfully. You're a humbug, said he. I am, retorted the tiger with a sneer. Tell me then, into how many pieces you usually tear your victims, my bold lion? The lion impatiently thumped the floor with his tail. To tear anyone into pieces would soil my claws and blunt my teeth, he said. I'm glad I didn't muss myself up this afternoon by hurting that poor woman. The tiger looked 
looked at him sternly, then yawned a wide, wide yawn. You're a coward, he remarked. Well, said the lion, it's better to be a coward than to do wrong. To be sure, answered the other, and that reminds me that I nearly lost my own reputation. For, had I eaten that fat baby, I would not now be the hungry tiger. It's better to go hungry, seems to me, than to be cruel to a child. And then they dropped their heads on their paws and went to sleep. Little Dorothy and Toto Dorothy was a little Kansas girl who once accidentally found the beautiful land of Oz and was invited to live there always. Toto was Dorothy's small black dog with fuzzy, curly hair and bright black eyes. Together, when they tired of the grandeur of the Emerald City of Oz, they would wander out into the country and all through the land, peering into queer nooks and corners and having a good time in their own simple way. There was a little wizard living in Oz, who was a faithful friend of Dorothy, and did not approve of her travelling alone in this way. But the girl always laughed at the little man's fears for her, and said she was not afraid of anything that might happen. One day, while on such a journey, Dorothy and Toto found themselves among the wild, wooded hills of the southeast of Oz, a place usually avoided by travellers because so many magical things abounded there, and as they entered a forest path, the little girl noticed a sign tacked to a tree, which said, Look out for Crinklink. Toto could not talk, as many of the animals of Oz can for he was just a common Kansas dog. But he looked at the sign so seriously that Dorothy almost believed he could read it, and she knew quite well that Toto understood every word she said to him. Never mind, Crinklink said she. I don't believe anything in Oz will try to hurt us, Toto. But if I get into trouble, you must take care of me. Bow wow, said Toto, and Dorothy knew that meant a promise. The path was narrow and wound here and there between the trees, but they could not lose their way, because thick vines and creepers shut them in on both sides. They had walked a long time, when suddenly, turning a curve of the pathway, they came upon a lake of black water 
so big and so deep that they were forced to stop. Well, Toto, said Dorothy, looking at the lake, we must turn back, I guess, for there is neither a bridge nor a boat to take us across the black water. He's the fairy man, though, cried a tiny voice beside them, and the girl gave a start and looked down at her feet, where a man no taller than three inches sat at the edge of the path with his legs dangling over the lake. Oh, said Dorothy, I didn't see you before. Toto growled fiercely and made his ears stand up straight. But the little man did not seem in the least afraid of the dog. He merely repeated, I'm the fairy man, and it's my business to carry people across the lake. Dorothy couldn't help feeling surprised, for she could have picked the little man up with one hand, and the lake was big and broad. Looking at the fairy man more closely, she saw that he had small eyes, a big nose, and a sharp chin. His hair was blue, and his clothes scarlet, and Dorothy noticed that every button on his jacket was the head of some animal. The top button was a bear's head, and the next button a wolf's head, and the next was a cat's head, and the next a weasel's head, while the last button of all was the head of a field mouse. When Dorothy looked into the eyes of these animal heads, they all nodded and said in a chorus, don't believe all you hear, little girl. Silence, said the small ferryman, slapping each button head in turn, but not hard enough to hurt them. Then he turned to Dorothy and asked, Do you wish to cross over the lake? Why, I'd like to she answered, hesitating. But I can't see how you will manage to carry us without any boat. If you can't see, you mustn't see, he answered with a laugh. All you need do is shut your eyes, say the word, and over you go. Dorothy wanted to get across, in order that she might continue her journey. All right, she said, closing her eyes. I'm ready. Instantly she was seized by a pair of strong arms, arms so big and powerful that she was startled and cried out in fear. Silence, roared a great voice, and the girl opened her eyes to find that the tiny man had suddenly grown into a giant, and was holding her and Toto in a tight embrace, while in one step he spanned the lake and reached the other shore. Dorothy became frightened then, especially as the giant did not stop, but continued tramping in great steps 
steps over the wooded hills, crushing bushes and trees beneath his broad feet. She struggled in vain to free herself, while Toto whined and trembled beside her, for the little dog was frightened too. Stop, screamed the girl. Let me down. But the giant paid no attention. Who are you, and where are you taking me? She continued. But the giant said not a word. Close to Dorothy's ear, however, a voice answered her, saying, This is the terrible crinkling and he has you in his power. Dorothy managed to twist her head round, and found it was the second button on the jacket, the wolf's head, which had spoken to her. What will Cricklink do with me? she asked anxiously. No one knows. You must wait and see, replied the wolf. Some of his captives he whips, squeaked the weasel's head. Some he transforms into bugs and other things, growled the bear's head. Some he enchants so they become doorknobs, sighed the cat's head. Some he makes his slaves, even as we are. That is the most dreadful fate of all, added the field mouse. As long as Cricklink exists, we shall remain buttons, but as there are no more buttonholes on his jacket, he will probably make you a slave. Dorothy began to wish she had not met Crick Clink. Meanwhile, the giant took such big steps that he soon reached the heart of the hills, where perched upon the highest peak stood a log castle. Before this castle, he paused to set down Dorothy and Toto, for Cricklink was, at present, far too large to enter his own doorway. So he made himself grow smaller, until he was about the size of an ordinary man. Then... He said to Dorothy, in stern, commanding tones, Enter, girl. Dorothy obeyed and entered the castle, with Toto at her heels. She found the place to be merely one big room. There was a table and a chair, of ordinary sides near the centre, and at one side a wee bed that seemed scarcely big enough for a doll. Everywhere else were dishes, dishes, dishes. They were all soiled, and they were piled upon the floor, and in all the corners, and upon every shelf. Evidently, Crinkling had not washed a dish for years, but had cast them aside as he used them. Dorothy's captor sat down in the chair and frowned at her. You are young and strong and will make a good dishwasher, said he. Do you mean you want me to wash all those dishes? she asked, 
feeling both indignant and fearful, for such a task would take weeks to accomplish. That's just what I mean, he retorted. I need clean dishes, for all I have are soiled, and you're going to make them clean or get trounced. So get to work, and be careful not to break anything. If you smash a dish, the penalty is one lash from my dreadful cat of nine tails, for every piece the dish breaks into. And here Crinklink displayed a terrible whip that made the little girl shudder. Dorothy knew how to wash dishes, but she remembered that she often carelessly broke one. In this case, however, a good deal depended on being careful, so she handled the dishes very cautiously. While she worked, Toto sat by the hearth and growled low at Crinklink, and Crinklink sat in his chair and growled at Dorothy because she moved so slowly. He expected her to break a dish at any moment, but as the hours passed away and this did not happen, Crinklink began to grow sleepy. It was tiresome watching the girl wash dishes, and often he glanced longingly at the tiny bed. Now he began to yawn, and he yawned and yawned, until finally he said, I'm going to take a nap. But the buttons on my jacket will be wide awake, and whenever you break a dish, the crutch will waken me. As I'm rather sleepy, I hope you won't interrupt my nap by breaking anything for a long time. Then Crinklink made himself grow smaller and smaller, until he was three inches high, and of a size to fit the tiny bed. At once he lay down and fell fast asleep. Dorothy came close to the buttons and whispered, Would you really warn Crinkling if I tried to escape? You can't escape, growled the bear. Crinkling would become a giant and soon overtake you. But you might kill him while he sleeps, suggested the cat in a soft voice. Oh, cried Dorothy, drawing back. I couldn't possibly kill anything even to save my life. But Toto had heard this conversation and was not so particular about killing monsters. Also, the little dog knew he must try to save his mistress. In an instant, he sprang upon the wee bed and was about to seize the sleeping crinkling in his jaws, when Dorothy heard a loud crash, and a heap of dishes fell from the table to the floor. Then the girl saw Toto and the little man rolling on the floor together, like a fuzzy ball, and when the ball stopped rolling, Behold, there was Toto, wagging his tail joyfully, 
and there sat the little wizard of Oz, laughing merrily at the expression of surprise on Dorothy's face. Yes, my dear, it's me, said he, and I've been playing tricks on you for your own good. I wanted to prove to you that it is really dangerous for a little girl to wander alone in a fairy country. So I took on the form of Crinklink to teach you a lesson. There isn't any Crinklink, to be sure. But if there had been, you'd be severely whipped for breaking all those dishes. The wizard now rose, took off the coat with the button heads, spread it on the floor wrong side up, and at once there crept from beneath it a bear, a wolf, a cat, a weasel, and a field mouse, all who rushed from the room to escape into the mountains. Come on, Toto, said Dorothy. Let's go back to the Emerald City. You've given me a good scare, wizard, she added, with dignity. And perhaps I'll forgive you by and by. But just now I'm mad to think how easily you fooled me. Tick Tock and the Gnome King the Gnome King was unpleasantly angry. He had carelessly bitten his tongue at breakfast, and it still hurt. So he roared and raved and stamped around in his underground palace, in a way that rendered him very disagreeable. It so happened that on this unfortunate day, Tick-Tock, the clockwork man, visited the Gnome King to ask for a favour. Tick-Tock lived in the land of Oz, and although he was an active and important person, he was made entirely of metal. Machinery within him Something like the works of a clock made him move. Other machinery made him talk. Still other machinery made him think. Although so cleverly constructed, the clockwork man was far from perfect. Three separate keys wound up his motion machinery, his speech works, and his thoughts. One or more of these contrivances was likely to run down at a critical moment, leaving poor Tick-Tock helpless. Also, some of his parts were wearing out through much use, and just now his thought machinery needed repair. The skilful little wizard of Oz had tinkered with Tick-Tock's thoughts without being able to get them properly regulated, so he had advised the clockwork man to go to the Gnome King and secure a new set of springs, which would render his thoughts more elastic and responsive. Be careful what you say to the Gnome King, warned the wizard. He is a bad temper, and the least little thing makes him angry. Tick-Tock promised and the wizard wound his machinery and set him walking in the direction 
of the Gnome King's dominions, just across the desert from the land of Oz. He ran down just as he reached the entrance to the underground palace, and there Calico, the Gnome King's chief steward, found him and wound him up again. I want to see the king, said Tick-Tock in his jerky voice. Well, remarked Calico, it may be safe for a cast-iron person like you to face his majesty this morning, but you must announce yourself, for should I show my face inside the jewel-studded cavern where the king is now, I'd soon look like a dish of mashed potatoes, and be no further use to anyone. I'm not afraid, said Tick-Tock. Then walk in and make yourself at home, answered Calico, and threw open the door of the king's cavern. Tick-Tock promptly walked in and faced the astonished Gnome King, to whom he said, Good morning. I want two new steel springs for my thought networks and a new cogwheel for my speech producer. How about it, your majesty? The Gnome King growled with a menacing growl, and his eyes were red with rage. How dare you enter my presence, he shouted. I dare anything, said Tick-Tock. I'm not afraid of a fat gnome. It was true, yet an unwise speech. Had Tick-Tock's thoughts been in good working order, he would have said something else. The angry Gnome King quickly caught up his heavy mace and hurled it straight at Tick-Tock. When it struck the metal man's breast, the force of the blow burst the bolts which held the plates of his body together, and they clattered to the floor in a score of pieces. Hundreds and hundreds of wheels, pins, cogs, and springs filled the air like a cloud and then rattled like hail upon the floor. Where Tick-Tock had stood was now only a scrap heap, and the Gnome King was so amazed by the terrible effect of his blow that he stared in wonder. His Majesty's anger quickly cooled. He remembered that the clockwork man was a favourite subject of the powerful Princess Ozma of Oz, who would be sure to resent Tick-Tock's ruin. Too bad, too bad, he muttered regretfully. I'm really sorry I made junk of the fellow. I didn't know he'd break. You'd better be, remarked Calico, who now ventured to enter the room. You'll have a war on your hands when Ozma hears of this and the chances are you will lose your throne and your kingdom. The Gnome King turned pale, for he loved to rule the gnomes, and did not know of any other way to earn a living in case Ozma fought and conquered him. Do, do you think Ozma will be angry? he asked anxiously. 
I'm sure of it, said Calico. And she has the right to be. You've made scrap iron of her favourite. The king groaned. Sweep him up and throw the rubbish in the black pit, he commanded. And then he shut himself up in his private den, and for days would see no one, because he was so ashamed of his unreasoning anger, and so revered the results of his rash act. Calico swept up the pieces, but he did not throw them into the black pit. Being a clever and skilful mechanic, he determined to fit the pieces together. No man ever faced a greater puzzle, but it was interesting work, and Calico succeeded. When he found a spring or wheel worn or imperfect, he made a new one. Within two weeks, by working steadily, night and day, the chief steward completed his task and put the three sets of clockworks and the last rivet into Tick Tock's body. He then wound up the motion machinery and the clockwork man walked up and down the room as naturally as ever. Then Calico wound up the thought works and the speech regulator, and said to Tick Tock, How do you feel now? Fine, said the clockwork man. You have done. A very good job, Calico, and saved me from destruction. Much obliged. Don't mention it, replied the chief steward. I quite enjoyed the work. Just then the Gnome King's gong sounded, and Calico rushed away through the jewel-studded cavern and into the den where the king had hidden, leaving the doors ajar. Calico, said the king in a meek voice, I've been shut up here long enough to repent bitterly the destruction of Tick-Tock. Of course, Ozma will have revenge and send an army to fight us. But we must take our medicine. One thing that comforts me, Tick-Tock wasn't really a live person. He was only a machine man. So it wasn't very wicked to stop his clockworks. I couldn't sleep at night at first for worry. But there's no more harm in smashing a machine man than breaking a wax doll. Don't you think so? I am too humble to think in the presence of your majesty, said Calico. Then get me something to eat, commanded the king, for I'm nearly starved. Two roast goats, a barrel of cakes, and nine mince pies will do me until dinner time. Calico bowed and hurried away to the royal kitchen, forgetting Tick Tock, who was wandering round the outer cavern. Suddenly the gnome king looked up and saw the clock workman standing before him, and at the sight the monarch's eyes grew big and round, 
and he fell a trembling in every limb. Away, grim shadow, he cried. You're not here, you know. You're not. You're only a hash of cogwheels and spring, lying at the bottom of the black pit. Vanish, thou vision of the demolished tick-tock, and leave me in peace, for I have bitterly repented. Then beg my pardon, said Tick-Tock, in a gruff voice, for Calico had forgotten to oil the speech-works. But the sounds of a voice coming from what he thought a mere vision was too much for the Gnome King's shaken nerves. He gave a yell of fear and rushed from the room. Tick-Tock followed, so the king bolted through the corridors on a swift run and bumped against Calico, who was returning with a tray of things to eat. The sound of breaking dishes as they struck the floor added to the king's terror, and he yelled again and dashed in to a great cavern where a thousand gnomes were at work hammering metal. Look out, here comes a phantom clockwork man, screamed the terrified monarch, and every gnome dropped his tools and made a rush from the cavern, knocking over their king in their mad flight and recklessly trampling upon his prostrate fat body. So, when Tick-Tock came into the cavern, there was only the Gnome King left, and he was rolling upon the rocky floor and howling for mercy, with his eyes fast shut so he could not see what he was sure was a dreadful phantom that was coming straight towards him. It occurs to me, said Tick-Tock calmly, that your majesty is acting like a baby. I am not a phantom. A phantom is unreal, while I am the real thing. The king rolled over, sat up, and opened his eyes. Didn't I smash you into pieces? he asked in trembling tones. Yes, said Tick-Tock. Then you are nothing but a junk heap, and this form in which you now appear cannot be real. It is, though declared Tick-Tock. Calico picked up my pieces and put me together again. I am as good as new, and perhaps better. That is true, your majesty, added Calico, who now made his appearance. And I hope you will forgive me for mending Tick-Tock. He was quite broken up after you smashed him, and I found it almost as hard a job to match his pieces as to pick turnips from gooseberry bushes. But I did it, he added proudly. You are forgiven, announced the Gnome King, rising to his feet and drawing a long breath. I will raise your wages one specto a year, and Tick-Tock shall return to the land of Oz, loaded with jewels for the Princess Ozma. That is all right, said Tick-Tock, but what I want to know is, why did you hit me with your mace? 
because I was angry, admitted the king. When I'm angry, I always do something that I'm sorry for afterwards. So I have firmly resolved never to get angry again, unless, unless, unless what, your majesty, inquired Calico. Unless something annoys me, said the Gnome King. And then he went to his treasure chamber to get the jewels for Princess Ozma. Peaceful slumbers. Sleep, sweet.